Hello and welcome to The Intentional Clinician. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. You may notice that I sound a little bit different in this episode. That is because I have a new microphone and a new audio setup, and I'm learning to add compression to the recordings. Some of the feedback I got about the recordings in 2017 was that some of the guests or myself were inconsistently either too soft or too loud. So I've upgraded. It's a new year and it's time to try some new things. So all the episodes from here on out, you should have much better audio experiences uh, wherever you are listening to this. So thank you so much for listening. We have over 2,000 downloads and now um, United States has the most downloads where before Canada was winning. But I'm Happy that you're all listening, wherever you are. So today's podcast is going to be a solo podcast with me talking about trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and different treatments such as EMDR therapy, and other things you can do. I get this question a lot when people are first being introduced to trauma or somebody has suggested that they get EMDR therapy. They want to know what is trauma, uh, what's the big deal about it, uh, why is the word trauma, not just in the DSM-5, we have PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, in the DSM-5. So there was a lot of information about the history of post-traumatic stress disorder, the history of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and other contextual and cultural factors that I would definitely encourage you all to research further. I'm going to give you a little summary, some for clinicians and also just for anyone wanting to know about trauma, because this subject could be talked about for months, years, days on this podcast. I could record all of the rest of these podcasts about the subject of trauma and the treatments, and I would probably never run out of things to say. So essentially, I'm trying to give a little bit of an overview today And this is by no means comprehensive. I am using um, research and resources, and I can post those in the show notes. So uh, the first thing I hear when I introduce the word trauma a lot to people is they're saying, well, whatever, it happened a long time ago. It's not that big of a deal. Why can't they just get over it? Why can't I just get over it? It's not even, you know, bothering me now. It was 10 years ago. Sometimes I think about it. So what happens a lot of times is that people, there's a cultural thing, especially where they feel like they should just be over an event. And logically, that may be, you know, a correct assessment. This happened four or five years ago, it was a breakup or whatever happened, and they should be quote unquote over it and moved on. But for some reason, they can't shake it. It's in their dreams, they're noticing it's affecting their relationships with other people, certain things from that time just it seems like that time is almost happening again so trauma is something that actually happens to our brains and so i think there's a lot of shame around not being stronger in um and like mentally stronger or physically stronger in our society and trauma isn't about that trauma is is a uh, physiological thing that happens to the brain And there's lots of lectures you can hear where they'll talk about the amygdala and the fight-flight-freeze response and the sympathetic nervous system response to this and how the amygdala is right near the hippocampus, which affects memory, and then how this can all help mess with the prefrontal cortex. And they can actually go through the brain science on this. And the neurobiology, which is a new emerging field, is confirming pretty much everything we've been learning about in counseling treatment with trauma and actually expanding our understanding of how it works. But when you have a traumatic experience happen, it's not up to you to determine if you should be over it or not and if it's going to affect you or impact you later on in life. It actually happens to your brain and on a physiological level. Um, you will have multiple symptoms perhaps stemming from that one incident or subsequent incidents or maybe just the way you think about the incident. And so it isn't about being strong to get over something. It isn't about you should or shouldn't be this way. It is actually an injury. The only difficulty is you can't 
see the injury physically, like a broken leg or a cut on your arm, or even having some type of surgery where you can say, well, my doctor says there's plaque in my heart and I need to get stints. The, the trauma happened in your brain, and usually we aren't just opening up people's brains for no reason. And it's not like you're, you know, oh, you've experienced trauma, your skin is now green. So now everyone knows you've experienced trauma. It, it can be, people can be very judgmental um, towards others when uh, they hear about trauma. You know, I've, I've seen eye rolling. What do you mean trauma? Well, that only applies to soldiers and rape victims. Well, it definitely applies to soldiers and rape victims, but it can also apply to a lot of other people too. So I'm going to talk about what is trauma and how it affects the brain. And yes, there is a diagnosis called post-traumatic stress disorder. So, But even if you don't meet that diagnosis, you may be experiencing multiple symptoms of that diagnosis. And a lot of times what I've been seeing as a therapist, this is anecdotal, but I know that there's literature out there about this. And I know a lot of other therapists have seen this as well, that um, there a traumatic event occurs and it's not treated, it's not dealt with, uh, it's not addressed, and eventually this leads to chronic anxiety, or chronic depression, or social anxiety, or can, can trigger these other illnesses or conditions or symptoms that you've definitely heard about. And in fact, some people even have theories that trauma could have been the starting point of how someone de developed a personality disorder or something even worse, like schizophrenia or bipolar. Not that it's the only cause. Remember, in this science and art we call psychology and the science of neurobiology, there's not always just one answer for things. Um, that's an old binary paradigm of the medical model, which is this plus this equals that. Well, we, we know that all the systems of the body affect one another, and we know that the brain is a very advanced system in the body, and has nerve endings attached to it that go all over your body, and it's a very complicated system we're still learning about. And so it's hard to study things in isolation. We've got to start understanding that, here's my metaphor, you like pie, hopefully you like pie, unless you can't eat sugar, I think you have a sugarless pie, but there are, you know, can be anywhere from four slices of a pie, that's how I like to cut it, and then, you know, eight slices of pie. I don't know if that's standard. Uh, but, you know, at some restaurants, they rip you off, and there's 16 slices of pie in the pie, so you get a very small piece. But with trauma and with mental illnesses and symptoms, there are multiple contributing factors, almost like there are pieces of pie. There might even be more that we don't know about. And that is another whole topic about... Um, you know, I've actually heard a lot of physicists uh, and, astro and people that are in that realm of science that are very knowledgeable people with PhDs uh, saying, well, this is what we know and this is what we don't know. And I would love if we could get more doctors on board with understanding that they may be an expert about this organ system, but are they an expert about how this organ system, uh, you know, works with other organ systems? Um, and not saying that they know everything, and, and being open to learning about how things interact. So I'm kind of coming from a paradigm of, of complex uh, thinking, but also trying to simplify things. So that is some of what we've been seeing. So there's a lot of new emerging research on trauma. It's being studied all over the place, and there are many things um, to learn about it. So I'm just going to go with some quotes here before I get into the stories. Um, Dr. Vander Kolk says that neuroscience research shows that the only way we can change the way we feel is by becoming aware of our inner experience and learning to befriend what is going on inside ourselves. Trauma victims cannot recover until they become familiar with and befriend the sensations in their bodies. Being frightened means that you live in a body that is always on guard. Angry people live in angry bodies. The bodies of a child abuse victims are tense and defensive until they find a way to relax and feel safe. In order to change, people need to become aware of their sensations and the way their bodies interact with the world around them. Physical awareness is the first physical awareness, excuse me, is the first step in releasing the tyranny of the past. In my practice, I begin the process by helping my patients to first notice and then describe the feelings in their bodies. Not emotions such as anger or anxiety 
or fear, but the physical sensations beneath the emotions, such as pressure, heat, muscular tension, tingling, caving in, feeling hollow, and so on. I also work on identifying the sensations associated with relaxation or pleasure. I help them become aware of their breath, their gestures, and movements. All too often, however, drugs such as Abilify, Zyprexa, and Seroquel are prescribed instead of teaching the people the skills to deal with with distressing physical reactions. Of course, medications only blunt sensations and do not resolve them or transform them from toxic agents into allies. The mind needs to be re-educated to feel sensa physical sensations, and the body needs to be helped to tolerate and enjoy the comforts of touch. Individuals who lack emotional awareness are able, with practice, to connect their physical se sensations to psych... physio... excuse me, <laughs> a lot of big words here... to connect their physical sensations to psychological events. So, if they lack emotional awareness, with practice, you can connect these physical sensations to psychological events. Then they can slowly reconnect themselves. Unlike other forms of psychological disorders, the core issue in trauma is reality. Traumatized people chronically feel unsafe in their, inside their bodies. The past is alive in the form of a gnawing interior discomfort. Their bodies are constantly bombarded by visceral warning signs and in an attempt to control these processes. They often become an expert at ignoring their gut feelings and in numbing awareness of what is played out inside. They learn to hide from themselves. That's Dr. Bessel A. van der Kolk from the book The Body Keeps the Score, M Brain, Mind, Body, and the Healing of Trauma. So this is another, this is leading right into what I was talking about, about this is not just happening in the brain. I, I Now I said it's happening in the brain, you can't see it. Well, yes, it happened there, but now the nervous system, which goes throughout your entire body, there's nerves all over your body, I don't know the numbers, um, are reacting. And so we've all heard the story about the war veteran who comes home and somebody slams a door and it, to him inside his physical body, all of a sudden he reacts. Hypervigilance. He might jump onto the floor. He might turn around. He might even uh, pull a gun out and think that a bomb has exploded or he might jump under a table. Uh, we've heard that. That's sort of a cliche, but that's actually a, an exaggerated form of how trauma can happen with just your average person who hasn't been to war. Um, it plays out inside the body, and a lot of times, you know, it's it's a uh, adaptive response to to ignore your body. I mean, if you've been traumatized sexually or physically, uh, you might want to be numb from your body, and that would make sense adaptively. But then eventually, you don't feel integrated, and there can be all sorts of different symptoms coming out. And so, Doctor Vanderkolk is talking about a very holistic form of treatment, which is almost re-educating the person and helping them to realize why they have certain physical sensations that are tied to psychological events. Obviously, he's talking very general. There are definitely excellent therapies, and I'll even talk about medications and natural therapies as well as many forms of counseling that can help people recover from trauma. Um, you can rewire the brain. That's the great news about neuroscience is that there, it's not, we have to get out of the paradigm that there is a, quote, cure, okay? The cure could be a very long, long winding road because the brain, uh, neurons that wire together, fire together. And so basically if your neurons were wired together during a traumatic childhood of 18 years, it's not going to be cured by one pill. Um, we have to almost relearn and rewire in a different way um, or as my friend said uh, in a former podcast previous to this one, um, we need to start digging a, a sand castle on an, another part of the beach. We have to make new neuronal connections, and we need to learn about when we're going back to the same hole and digging. Um, and so that is, we're starting to get into the paradigm of trauma. So Peter Levine is another trauma expert. Um, he said, although humans rarely die from trauma, if we do not resolve it, our lives can be severely diminished by its effects. Some people have even described the situation as a, quote, living death. I have come to the conclusion that human beings are born with an innate capacity to triumph over trauma. I believe not only the trauma is curable, but that the healing process can be a catalyst for profound awakening, a portal opening to emotional and genuine spiritual transformation. I have little doubt that as individuals, families, communities, and even nations, we have the capacity to learn how to heal and prevent much of the damage done by trauma. In so doing, we will significantly increase our ability to achieve both our individual and collective dreams. Now, that's a very um, macro statement by Peter Levine from Healing Trauma, a pioneering program for restoring the wisdom of 
your body. But I think it's universal. Every one of us has gone through some trauma. Whether or not we developed symptoms from it is a whole nother discussion. And I will, I have some examples later on where we can actually identify if you have experienced a trauma yourself and some ways to identify what are traumas, what is trauma. And I'm sure that almost everyone listening to this podcast will actually be able to identify uh, a trauma. Obviously, this is not a substitute for treatment. I always say that at the end, if you need counseling, please find a very good trauma-informed counselor immediately and start um, seeing them. Here is Francine Shapiro, Getting Past Your Past, Take Control of Your Life with Self-Help Techniques from EMDR. Uh, She says, Today, more than 20 scientifically controlled studies of EMDR have proven its effectiveness in the treatment of traumatic and other disturbing life experiences. I think the number is upwards of 60 now. I think this was written years ago. So um, she talks about some things you can do. Begin a daily use of self-control techniques you've already learned. Remember to practice safe and calm place technique every day to strengthen it. So when you feel desert- disturbed, you can bring back the positive feelings. So in this, we're almost practicing, um, and I'll talk, this is a therapy technique. We're, this is not even the one where you address the the bad memories or the ba- or the symptoms or whatever this is um she's talking about building up the ability to even tolerate positive emotions and expanding your window of tolerance of emotions uh, because trauma constricts those we don't want to get too low we don't want to get too high we're hyper vigilant we're constricting our skin our body um she's talking about practicing the positive emotions because we if we've been traumatized we may have just dwelled in this low depression mode for a long time or anxiety so if you didn't find your mind moving into something negative use the bilateral tapping technique so th- this is something uh you it's more from EMDR you've heard about the eye movement eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy Um, we'll get into that more later in the episode. Um, she talks about the breathing shift technique, the cartoon character technique to deal with negative self-talk. So Francine Shapiro has a lot of really great tools that you can do at home. And also she invented EMDR therapy, which I'm going to go into detail about. As you explore your own unconscious processes, you'll find that understanding why things are happening can help even more. So a lot of times if people have been traumatized, we're running around, we don't even realize we've been traumatized, and um, we don't realize that we're reacting from this trauma, and it's actually possibly impacting our job, our relationships, the narrative we are telling people, how we are performing, and it's really tragic that some people actually never figure out that they had a trauma, and it's not that we want to wave the flag of trauma and say, hey, feel sorry for us. It's so that we can deal with this, so we can understand why the unconscious is afflicting us, and so that we can move past it, rewire the brain, decrease our reactivity to things that remind us of the trauma. Um, so that is the point of this, not to say, hey, we've all been traumatized. This is, that's, that, that's a binary and to, to kind of shame that, I, I've heard people kind of shame, like, oh, we're just a therapy society. Um, okay, well, yeah, that's a binary argument of a black and white thing. We're, we're trying to open up the human experience and be not just good or bad, black and white, but there's a rainbow of color between uh, binary opposites. And unfortunately, in today's um, society, you hear a lot of binary discussion. Um, black and white it's either it's us versus them it's this or it's that and the 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 trouble is is that uh it it there's there's truth along a giant spectrum um and sometime you know we'll get into that later and i think uh stress and um being stressed drives people towards binary thinking and i think that has got something to do with what's going on the dialogue so So to open up more about what trauma is, I think we need to consult the Adverse Child Experiences Study. The Adverse Child Experiences Study is a research study that was conducted um, by the Kaiser Permanente Organization and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, There has been many follow-up studies, but the first study happened between 95 and 97. So the study has demonstrated an association of Adverse Child Experiences, ACE, or ACEs, with health and social problems as an adult. And what the study found was amazing. 
uh, for people that experience adverse child experiences, uh, and the more they experience, the worst health outcomes they had and the worst psychological outcomes they had as adults, I mean, increased risk of smoking, childhood pregnancy, alcohol abuse, all of these things. And I'll get more into that in a moment. Um, this study is a landmark study. It's amazing. It's produced more than 50 articles and has had more than 100 conference and workshop presentations to look at the prevalence and consequences of adverse child experiences. I've been to some of these um, studies. So, and I won't explain the whole history of it because that's not, you could have a whole five-part, ten-part series on the ACE studies of a, uh, a podcast about that. But here are some of the things Participants were asked to uh, to identify 10 types of childhood trauma. Um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, uh, a parent treated them violently, household substance abuse, household mental illness, parental separation or divorce, or an incarcerated household member. What they found was that adverse child experiences are quite common. SAMHSA found this out, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. For example, 28% of study participants reported physical abuse, 21% reported sexual abuse. Uh, many reported divorce or separation. So, uh, And what they also found was that a lot of these experiences occur together. Almost 40% of the original sample reported two or more adverse child experiences and 12.5% experienced four or more. Because of these ACEs occurring in clusters, many subsequent studies have examined the cumulative effects of ACEs rather than the individual effects of them. And so what we have found with this through this study, this is just a gross summary, is that they have a dose-response relationship with many health problems. As researchers followed participants over time, they discovered that a person's cumulative ACE score uh, had a strong graded relationship with numerous health, social, and behavioral problems throughout the lifespan, including substance use disorders. Furthermore, many problems related to ACEs, adverse child experiences, tend to be comorbid or co-occurring. Co-occurring is when you have a possibly mental illness symptoms combined with a, an addiction. And over the lifespan, they found that the early, uh, early adverse child experiences led to social, emotional, or cognitive impairment. And then... Uh, eventually the adoption of healthy uh, of health risk behaviors or risky behaviors and eventually disease disability social problems and then an early death um, for instance the okay so people that had at least one adverse child experiences 80 percent of those individuals also reported having another one but the number of aces was strongly associated with adult high-risk health behaviors such as smoking, alcohol, and drug abuse, promiscuity, severe obesity, and correlated with ill health, including depression, heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, and a shortened lifespan. So this is amazing. This is not just talking about mental illnesses, okay? These are hard outcomes. This is cancer, heart disease, chronic lung disease, shortened lifespan. So... Mental health and brain health are so important to be taken care of. And if you've had any adverse child experiences, even if they're not on this list and you feel that you have, because the subjective experience is what's more important than what the what some sort of category would put you in, uh, you definitely need to address your trauma because this can lead to all sorts of diverse problems. Um, if you, if you, now the, I'm not going to go into the scoring, but if you had an ACE score of zero, meaning no events, or having four versus having four adverse child experiences was associated with a 700% increase in alcohol, alcoholism, a doubling of the risk of being diagnosed with cancer and a fourfold increase in emphysema. An ACE score of six was associated with 30-fold, 3,000% increase in attempted suicide. The ACE study's results suggested that maltreatment and household dysfunction in childhood contribute to health problems decades later. These include chronic diseases, which I already discussed, like heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes, that are the most common causes of death and disability in the United States. The study's findings, while related to the specific population within the United States, might reasonably be assumed to reflect similar trends in other parts of the world, according to the World Health Organization. And they've done many, many tests all over the United States and the world since then. So uh, this is the deal. I mean, if we can deal with brain health and mental health and trauma 
at a young age, maybe even in schools or in therapy office or whatever, and help people, we are going to decrease all sorts of risk factors and um, healthy, like uh, unhealthy behaviors in the United States without having to just tell people, you know, stop smoking, stop drinking, you know, eat better. I mean, this stuff is happening. These poor coping skills are getting put in place. We're not exactly sure why, but it has a correlation with uh, adverse child experiences or trauma. So I did, this is a little bit in here. I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, the neurobiology of stress. Um, so some of them believe that the cognitive and neuroscience researchers can believe that these adverse child experiences can literally alter the structural development of neural networks in your brain while you're growing up and possibly the biochemistry of your neuroendocrine systems and may have long-term effects on the body, including, including speeding up the processes of disease and aging and compromising immune systems. Additionally, epigenetic transmission may occur due to stress during pregnancy or during interactions between mothers and newborns. Maternal stress, depression, and exposure to partner violence have all been shown to have epigenetic effects on humans, or infants, sorry, infant humans. So basically what that means is that you are possibly passing this down in your DNA, and also what we've been learning about epigenetics, and this is just my very small understanding of it, is that... We don't know exactly what causes gene expression to result in certain diseases being triggered, but we do know that stress can cause things to trigger, where you might have a couple siblings, all of them have some sort of genetic link to colon cancer, but only one of them gets the colon cancer because they had all this stress and trauma in their life, and it possibly triggered it. That's, of course, a correlation. It's not totally proven because, again, the way we study things is very isolated, and we're trying to start studying uh, things that are more cross-disciplinary and involving multiple symptoms, and that's a much more difficult thing to study. So there is much more information available online and in books from the World Health Organization the Centers for Disease and Control, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. You can find that all online or in books and journals. So I'm going to let that kind of, we're going to kind of start coming into some summary. But here is a little a little piece before I stop talking about that study, which is that uh, in the words of Dr. Robert Block, the former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, adverse child experiences are the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. And then another person said, uh, this is Judith Lewis Herman, who wrote a book called Trauma and Recovery, The Aftermath of Violence. Repeated trauma in childhood forms deforms the personality. The child trapped in an abusive environment is faced with formidable tasks of adaptation. She must find a way to preserve a sense of trust in people who are untrustworthy, safety in a situation that is unsafe, control in a situation that is terrifyingly unpredictable, power in a situation of helplessness, unable to care for or protect herself. She must compensate for the failures of adult care and protection with the only means at her disposal, an immature system of psychological defenses. And some of the things they talk about in the study are single, well, we've, I'll, kind of summarize. This isn't just from the ACE study. This is sort of my understanding. So there's a single incident trauma where we maybe we had very safe upbringing. We didn't have adverse child experiences other than this one time that our mom got in a car accident and she almost died and it impacted us greatly and it made us scared. It made us, made us fear every time our mom was driving. We started getting worried about that. That may be a single incident trauma where it wasn't repeated exposure to adverse child experiences. And then they talk about big T versus little t traumas. Um, I, I'm less interested in knowing what those traumas are as much as what is the subjective experience of the person. If, if a traumatic experience overwhelmed the nervous system and essentially materialized almost with post-traumatic stress disorder type symptoms, it doesn't really matter if it's a big T or little t trauma. It matters that they have the trauma and we need to treat it. Um, so there's also what they call developmental trauma, which is over time or when you're really a little baby having a lot of bad things happen to you and complex traumas. That's when people have been abused multiple times. Maybe they went through a war and then other things. And then subsequent traumas 
I've just thought about this the other day. Some people have had childhood trauma and they've, you know, got past a period of depression. Maybe they got it treated and all of a sudden they move somewhere or they get divorced or something or they get in a car accident. All of a sudden, and not only that trauma is bothering them and really giving them a lot of problems or anxiety or symptoms, but it also triggers um, thoughts and feelings from their previous trauma. Because this is happening in the brain, this is happening without our permission. And whether or not you want to admit it, you know, if you've had something like this, you can try to bury it, but it just keeps coming up. So, and many, many systems are affected, not just the brain systems like I was talking about earlier in the nervous system. I mean, what we're finding out from adverse child experiences is there's correlations to hard health outcomes, you know, heart disease. So, September 11th, 2001, where were you? This is what I would call a shared or collective trauma. Um, I was a sophomore at Michigan State University, and I remember distinctly that morning. I remember waking up in a great mood. I was going to see the band Jimmy Eat World, shout out, in Detroit with some friends. And I remember thinking, this is just such a gorgeous day. It was sunny. I remember that. It was Michigan, and I remembered it was sunny. So there you go. I have a vivid recollection of that morning. And I remember listening to some music, I was reading something, and then I went up to the cafeteria where I saw everyone standing around televisions, didn't think too much of it, but I was thinking, hmm, I wonder what they're all watching. And then I went into the cafeteria and had multiple conversations with people who were confused. Uh, everyone seemed to be in a state of shock. People seemed to be look, almost zombie-like. And I remember talking to this guy named Jonathan, who said, I think they bom somebody bombed uh, New York. And I was like, what? And then, of course, I was intrigued and found out that uh, a, a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center, and I went out to the lobby where everyone was watching the news, uh, and I saw the second plane hit, and I remember the whole day. I remember going to class. My professor was unaware of it. We told him. He eventually had us write down our feelings for five minutes, and then we left class. I remember having to miss the Jimmy Eat World show, which got rescheduled, which I remember going to that, too, uh, getting phone calls. Now... I know where I was, and a lot of people who were alive uh, and not just like little kids remember that day very vividly because it's a collective trauma. Even if you weren't affected personally, I didn't know any who, anyone who died in that attack. It was it, it, it affects our brains maybe in a similar way. So it, it's an example without having to actually go through a personal trauma. It's sort of like the brain keeps bringing it up, and I remember thinking, "Gosh, this is so terrible." And the and part of the trauma was maybe the way the media covered it, um, maybe the way it was discussed, maybe it was part of the trauma for you was the laws that were passed afterwards, or people that died, or maybe starting the war was the trauma for you. I know a lot of friends I had were in the war after that, um, but it was much different than my friend Sivi, who was actually right next to Ground Zero when the planes hit the World Trade Center. And she was driven out of her office building, ran outside, got covered in ash, and luckily went the right way and walked all the way from South Manhattan to the north side where she was living and didn't even get on the train. It was dehydrated and felt like a zombie and had all sorts of uh, PTSD symptoms for a while until she uh, got treatment. Um, her, her story is much different than mine. Um, but she still remembers that day vividly, but probably, possibly even more vividly and with more uh, difficulties than I do. Uh, and so that is a, a very small example. Now, you know, you may not have symptoms from that. Well, it didn't happen to you directly, but those of you who had somebody die or, or maybe somebody get, go to war and die because, uh, you know, eventually that turned into the second, uh, Gulf war or whatever you want to call it. Um, the, you know, the war that happened in 2003, uh, you know, that, that could be connected to that trauma. There's so many branches that could be connected to those events that day. And of course, there was much more to say about that. But that's an example of the brain bringing something up vividly that happens. So just imagine if the worst thing that ever happened to you won't come out of your, won't leave your brain, it won't leave you alone. And then there's all these different ways uh, of thinking about the world that can happen. For instance, um, from EMDR therapy, for instance, um, 
there that can hit the safety and vulnerability chain. So like you might start having co- core feelings or thoughts that I'm not safe. I can't trust anyone. I'm in danger. I can't protect myself. So at that time, I was friends with uh, my friend was from India and which is not even anywhere near Iraq uh, or, or Afghanistan where, you know, well, eventually we found those people. Some of them were from Afghanistan who attacked the United States, but he wasn't even from anywhere. And he was getting yelled at in the street um, because he was Indian and looked sort of like we thought what the attackers would look like. I guess he had brown skin. So w- I was trying to try to protect him and trying to talk to him about that. About I remember, you know, people not trusting him. Uh, and I think that's probably because the safety vulnerability had gone off. And then it generalized to sort of this you know, categorizing everybody, binary. Um, well, he doesn't look like a terrorist, so he might, they're probably safe. But if he looks like, you know, if he has any facial features resembling this or skin issues, then he must be like this. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not safe. I can't trust them. And, and uh, I remember there was incidents, terrible incidents of, of violence uh, towards Muslims and anyone who didn't look or anyone who resembled the skin tone of, of uh, the people on 9-11 that attacked the United States. And that's a very poor way to handle your anger and your frustration and your fear. But I can see from a trauma perspective that people weren't feeling safe and they started categorizing people, which is a very dangerous thing to do. But what people do a lot under stress, um, and it's a very co- poor coping skill. And perhaps all those people that were attacking, they needed treatment um, to work through their emotions and work through their feelings about this and figure out something productive to do other than hit random citizens who might be Sikhs or even actual, even the nonviolent Muslims, which are almost all of them. Same with the nonviolent Christians. If you look at the statistics, they're, they're mostly nonviolent people. Same with Christians, same with every religion. It's the, the extremists and the, and, and sometimes fundamentalists who, who cause this sort of damage. So, uh, for instance, you know, if somebody had known somebody in the attack and they, you know, had gone on one of the flights, there could be a responsibility like, I should have done something, I should have told them not to go, when it wasn't their fault. Now, when a trauma happens to us personally, um, you know, like as a child, I hear this all the time, or a breakup, like a parent will react terribly to a child and beat them, and the child thinks, I'm weak, I'm worthless, I'm inadequate, and that gets stuck in their brain, and then they actually act like that as an adult instead of seeing their intrinsic value or a breakup happens and then somebody says, you know what, I'm just unlovable versus, you know, that person chose to not treat me right or not love me or just they weren't the right match for me. Or a lot of times if somebody makes a mistake in their life and they hurt somebody, uh, they think, you know, I can't be trusted. I can't trust myself. I'll never trust myself again. And they might do really extreme things uh, to themselves, um, cause that's a control and choice. Or, um, if they got fired, uh, this one I hear a lot, I'm powerless and I can't trust anyone. Those two safety, vulnerability, and control and choice come up, or I should have known better. Re- I'm taking responsibility for that. And sometimes you do need to take responsibility for getting fired, but sometimes it's out of your control, especially getting laid off. You know, all these people that got laid off, uh, from GM in the eighties and nineties, I, lived in Michigan. So there was a lot of very angry people um, because of those layoffs. Um, and that's a form of trauma. It can be, depending on the person. Some people obviously uh, have different resilience, different stress response, and might be able to cope with it in a different way. But some people you know, can get full-blown PTSD from being fired. So another story, my both my grandfathers were war veterans, but one of my grandfathers... Um, who was in the Navy, both were in the Navy, but one of them actually, he lost his only brother in the war within a few days of D-Day, June 6, 1944, with the United States landing in Normandy, France. And um, and then later on, he was in the war himself in the Pacific Theater, and he was in the Battle of Okinawa and Iwo Jima, and he was a radar man on a um, small aircraft carrier, and I remember asking him, I, you know, asking him, he was in his 70s at the time, and I was a teenager, and I was asking him questions about the war, and I remember he used to just say, I don't want to talk about it. No, I don't want to talk about it. And he never would bring up his brother. I found that out from my mother that he lost his brother. Um, I do remember one time he was really reactionary when I was talking about going to a Japanese restaurant, and he's, he said a slur and said, I don't want to go there. And um, I remember thinking, well, Why? 
I didn't understand. And then my mom said, well, you know, he was fighting the Japanese in the war, and sometimes he gets really upset about this. And then I remember the last two years of his life, he actually did tell me stories about being in the war, because I kept asking, because I was interested in it at the time. And he told me about the typhoons and also the kamikazes, and he was a radar guy, and he t- he... I remember he would often start a story and he wouldn't finish it. He would just sort of trail off and like turn on the television. But I remember him telling me a story about how he wished he would have known that these fighters were coming in. And I guess another ship, um, a bunch of people died on it. And he felt responsible is what I gained from the from the talk. And I think that's a trauma right there. He felt responsible for other people's death, even though he couldn't have prevented it and didn't have any ability to... Um, warn the ship in time, the nearby ship, and he had friends die in that ship. So uh, that's a story of trauma. Now, I think it was untreated, and obviously he was still reacting towards uh, Japanese people when he was in his 70s, and, you know, but he had a lot of pain there. So untreated trauma, he's not going to be able to resolve and integrate that trauma into his story, and he lost his only brother. He never saw his brother again. Um, And that was, of course, against, uh, I guess, landing in uh, France. I'm not sure, I think fighting the Germans, the uh, the Nazis. I shouldn't say the Germans. I should say the Nazis. I'm German. Anyway, um, that's another example. So, you know, sometimes the, the, the trauma is big and pronounced like a war, but sometimes, like I said, it's a breakup. Um, I've worked or met people who would have a, an emotional reaction to a breakup that from a small maybe like they were in a relationship with somebody for two months a romantic relationship and this breakup brought up all of these unresolved issues from their childhood and they had intense reactions and so sometimes if you don't have a therapist who's trauma informed and I've seen this multiple times I'm not trying to hate on therapists but please get your education do your continuing education please get up to speed with this brain science, I've heard of therapists rolling their eyes and saying, you just need to get over the breakup. You just need to get over the breakup. It's not that bad. She just wasn't right for you. He wasn't right for you. It was only two months. It was only da-da-da-da-da. And, ra- and, and, and like at that point, how, how different are you than a, a friend or family member? I mean, honestly. So that tra- it, it, sometimes the trauma isn't about the breakup. It, it's about the breakup, but it's only one piece of the pie. The breakup triggered these feelings of abandonment from childhood it uh, it it uh, brought up. Um, they feel like they're responsible for it. They're ugly. They're unlovable, and then they just start drinking all the time to cope or whatever. So we have to understand how this can impact it. It's not it's not our place to judge the event, whether it's the war or or a or a puppy love breakup by a fifth two fifth graders. Okay, it's about what the event means to that person and what it is doing to their brain, which we are not able to see. We have to listen to people and understand that their story is more valued than our judgment. We have to, you know, therapists are non-judgmental, but we have to try to judge what's going on for safety issues. But why are we judging the degree of trauma? Especially, well, we'll talk about this later. Um, Doctors, a lot of doctors do not get this. Please, doctors, go to trauma-informed therapy uh, conferences, or I'm hoping that some doctor is going to develop a training on this. Um, you know, for uh, for instance, I have another story. My father lost his mother when he was 15, and he actually woke up in the middle of the night. She couldn't breathe, and I don't know the entire story because I've only heard fragments of it, but essentially he watched her die in front of his eyes from some sort type of pulmonary issue. And the ambulance came. I think he was called them or something, but anyway, she died. And I remember hearing about this as a kid, of course, I didn't know the details about him, her dying in front of him until I was older, but I remember on Mother's Day, he would always cry, and he would be upset anytime her name was brought up, and then I know that trauma was further further complicated by his difficult relationship with his stepmother, um, who was my grandma, and I know this affected him his whole life. I, I've seen evidence of it, and yeah, he's gotten treatment for it, and he's a lot better now, but it impacted so much of his life, especially back in the 60s when this happened, for years, years, until he was able to get some treatment and some support around it. Different things he, different choices he made were, 
not, you know, directly, you can't say, okay, it was directly because his mom died in front of his face, but it influenced his worldview, it influenced his behavior, it influenced his friend's choices, it influenced his dating choices, it influenced his self-esteem, it influenced his ability to see the world as a safe place or not a safe place or whatever. These sort of things happen. Um, I've heard of situations with car accidents. And um, for instance, what if you have a car accident, but you need to drive to get to your job, and now you have a trauma that every time you come up to a stoplight a certain way, it reminds you of the accident because the trauma is locked in your brain. And you can't drive. What do you do? you got to get treatment. Um, this sort of thing happens all the time. Uh, people that were bullied... Uh, for instance, what if you were bullied by, let's say, a group of boys, and you're a girl, and uh, then you, this happened when you were in sixth grade, and everybody's like, oh, you know, you're sixth grade, let the water roll off your back like a duck, don't worry about it, you'll just get over it, no big deal, they're just jerks, we'll get them, you know, and then you grow older, and now you're afraid to, you know, when you become 18 or 19, 20, you might be avoiding um, talking to males or hanging out with males because of this bullying. And now that bullying was a trauma, which is affecting your behavior. Um, because the boys, other males represent the people that inflicted the trauma on you. And that's not just some, it, it, I mean, it is a choice in a way with the brain, but trauma, a lot of times usurps our ability to cope. And we're still responsible for our actions, but it's influencing our actions. So a lot of you, here's some, here's an easy example. My last example before we get into some the next part of this podcast. Um, my friends have a dog named Kendra. And when you come see Kendra in, and you come into the room, Kendra is always about seven feet away from you, um, looking at you and, and trying to be as far away from you as possible. Um, if you keep your arms at your side for a long time and, you, and the, her owner's... Uh, approach you with, you know, positive voices and encourage her. She'll come out and lick your hand, and then she'll run away. If you lift up your arm to pet Kendra, she'll recoil immediately. And this is, I've met Kendra, gosh, at least 50 times in person, and she knows my smell, I'm pretty sure. She's a dog. And uh, she still is scared of me every time I come over. So um, now, of course, as a puppy, Kendra was traumatized. We're not exactly sure what happened because she doesn't speak English. But uh, my friend adopted her. She was beaten, we believe, by um, people. And she has some type of trauma. Now, obviously, dog brains are different than people brains. But apparently, lately, Kendra has been a little bit more friendly with new people. Um, but she's still skittish. And um, she is very you know, friendly with her owners. But even then, she doesn't... Um, come up to them and put her head on them as often as their other dog who didn't experience trauma. So humans are, we're, we're mammals. We're part of nature. We're part of this, you know, we're, we're programmed. We, we, we all have similar nervous systems, completely different. I'm not a vet, but we are subject to the laws of nature. So that's a very easy example to see. But humans have these stories that we tell ourselves, and it's hard for us sometimes to see the reality of how the brain reacts to things because we make up stories about it because we're not sure how to how to do it. Um, here's a here's a classic story: uh, a guy gets his heart broken, quote unquote, from him uh, by a, a woman he feels unjustly, and then he just starts making up narratives about how all women are this and all women are that, and women are crazy and da da da, and he doesn't start to consider his own behavior in the situation he doesn't consider that he doesn't know anything about women he doesn't know he doesn't understand that he hasn't read the science behind female brains and what's attractive to women uh john gottman and his wife and a bunch of other researchers wrote a book called man's guide to women i try to get men to read this i wish i would have read this when i was younger because um women are very different than men in many ways biologically um due to hormones and different things not that and it's not a judgment, it's just it's just true from science um, because of the way the hormones affect the brain and the sense of smell and, and different things like that. And also, women are often thinking of safety much more than males. For instance, I don't know, if you're not in the war, all of you out there, how many of you men have felt that your life was threatened any time in the last 30 days? And women, how many times do you feel like your safety, your life 
is threatened. And I don't mean somebody came up to you with a knife. I mean that you felt unsafe. How many men have felt unsafe in the last 30 days walking around their neighborhood? How many women have? And so there's a lot of different factors going on due to not just hormones, but also just um, different factors uh, that we have to consider. So uh, the male that went through the trauma of getting broken up, it's a trauma to him. And, and to another guy, he might, another guy who's read those books who might go, well, you know what? She just wasn't into me and it wasn't a good fit. No big deal. Whatever. Uh, she didn't like my pheromones. Uh, and, you know, and he's able to cope uh, more successfully and not turn to some negative narrative. But humans make up narratives all the time. I mean, all these narratives that you heard, like these, these beliefs, like I'm terrible or they're terrible. If something bad happens to me, I blame myself or I blame someone else or I blame the world. The world's unsafe. So this is how trauma affects us. And we're not able to live in the in-between. It drives us to the binary. It drives us to the extremes. So because it's overwhelmed. Now, I, uh, I love this book, The DSM, Insanely Simplified. And they talk about a severe trauma is um, you experience a trauma, you witness a trauma, or learned about a violent trauma to a loved one. Uh, you can have intrusive memories, nightmares, or flashbacks. You have avoidance. Avoidance is so big. You avoid memories, thoughts, feelings, reminders of the trauma. Okay? This is so huge because a lot of people don't even identify a trauma because they've just been avoiding anything that resembles or reminds them of the trauma for years. Uh, you can have negative thoughts and feelings about the event. You can have amnesia to the event, meaning you don't remember it very well. You can have exaggerated negative beliefs, self-blame, persistent fear, anger, horror, shame, low interest in activities, feeling detached, feeling numb. Hyper arousal. This one is huge, meaning you have hypervigilance. You have very, you know, very constricted body. Uh, you have an exaggerated startle response. Your friend come up to you and put her hand on your, on your shoulder and you're like, oh my gosh, and you shake. You're reckless or have self-destructive behavior. That's a huge one. People are like, what is that kid just acting out? Well, have they had trauma? We have to think about that. Yeah, they're responsible for their actions, but we need to figure out, do they need treatment? Poor concentration. I won't even go into this because there there should be, there's probably eight books written on this and podcasts. The amount of crossover with ADHD and PTSD is so wild when it comes to poor concentration and emotional lability and, and sort of not being able to pay attention. So watch for that in kids. Insomnia, another one, hyperarousal. Um, and the symptoms have to persist for a month or so and have work and social impairment. Now, the DSM-5, of course, is much more uh, rigid in their definition because we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder um, and... You have to have criterion one, like you've witnessed it or seen it or indirect, right? I mean, first responders and medics can have trauma because they were exposed to it in the course of duty. Police officers who see people die or fired, uh, firefighters, okay? They can have trauma just from not even being trauma, not even being injured themselves, but witnessing it. They have to have criterion B for post-traumatic stress disorder, which I'm not going to go over everything. This isn't a science class, but the traumatic event is persistently re-experienced in the following ways, intrusive thoughts, nightmares, flashbacks, emotional distress after exposure to traumatic reminders, physical reactivity after exposures to traumatic reminders. So that's that physical piece, the mind-body piece we talked about earlier. It's not just in the brain, it's in the body. Criterion C you need one of these. Avoidance of all trauma-related stimuli after the trauma in the following ways. They try to avoid thoughts or feelings about it or any reminders. Now you need two of these, criterion D, which is negative thoughts or feelings that begin at or worsened after the trauma in the following ways. So two of these. So the negative thoughts and feelings worsened after the trauma. Inability to recall key features of the trauma. Overly negative thoughts and assumptions about oneself or the world. Exaggerated blame of self or others for causing the trauma. Negative affect, which is your um, the way you appear, your face. Decreased interest in activities, feeling isolated, difficulty experiencing positive affects or smiling or positive feelings like joy. Um, criterion E, two required. Trauma-related arousal and reactivity begins or worsened after the trauma in the following ways. Irritability or aggression. Risky or destructive behavior. Hypervigilance. Heightened startle response, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping. Criterion F is required. Symptoms last for more than one month. So sometimes you can have all these symptoms for three weeks, and if you get better, eh, you don't have post-traumatic stress disorder. You might just have quote-unquote trauma. Criterion G, 
Symptoms create distress for functional impairment, social or occupational. Criterion H, symptoms are not due to medication, substance abuse, or another illness. Uh, then we have specifiers, disassociative. Um, in addition to meeting the criteria for diagnosis, an individual experiences high level of either of the following in reaction to trauma-related trauma stimuli. So they get, they get around something that reminds them of the trauma. They have depersonalization, which is the experience of being an outside observer or detached from oneself, feeling as if, quote, this is not happening to me or we are in a dream. Or derealization, experience of unreality, distance, or distortion. Example, things are not real. Um, and then delayed specification. Full diagnostic criteria are not met until at least six months after the trauma, although onset of symptoms may occur immediately. And we could go on, because this is slightly different than the DSM-4. This is the newest diagnostic amendment statistical manual. So that's the full PTSD diagnosis. Now, you know, might not all have that, or, or people don't, but everyone's experienced some of those symptoms. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about um, what these symptoms are, and then uh, we're going to talk about some treatments and what you can do about it and how you can actually heal the brain. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the symptoms. So this is some of how people experience it. The mind replays what the body can't delete. Hyperarousal. After a traumatic experience, the human system of self-preservation seems to go into permanent alert, as if the danger might return at any moment. Physiological arousal continues unabated. In the state of hyperarousal, which is the first cardinal symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder, the traumatized person startles easily reacts irritably to small provocations, and sleeps poorly. Cardiner proposed that, quote, the nucleus of the traumatic neurosis is physioneurosis. That's an old book. <laughs> he believed that many of the symptoms observed in combat veterans of the First World War startle reactions, hyper-alertness, vigilance for the return of danger, nightmares, and psychosomatic complaints could be understood as resulting from chronic arousal of the autonomic nervous system. He also interpreted the irritability and explosively aggressive behavior of traumatized men as disorganized fragments of a shattered, quote, fight-or-flight response to overwhelming danger. That's from Judith Lewis Herman, Trauma and Recovery Book, From Domestic Abuse to Political Terror, and she's quoting Cardiner. The conflict between the will to deny horrible events and the will to proclaim them aloud is the central dialect of psychological trauma. Judith Her Lewis Herman said that. So... Yeah, I mean, some people just try to hide it, and other people go into sort of aggressive behaviors where they're almost what they call in psychology projecting their anger onto other people or projecting their trauma of what happened to them onto others. And it's not that things go one way or another. I mean, again, there's so many different ways this can go, but that's just one of the things that can happen. I remember when I was younger, I had a trauma that I'm not going to go into in detail because you aren't my therapist— out there in podcast land, but I was about four or five years old. And the odd thing about this trauma w was that it was actually all of the adults' reaction to what happened um, in the situation that basically made me hang on to this memory. I had nightmares for years, and it was the nightmares weren't about what happened with the the other person that did something to me, but and it was a child, by the way, I should put that out there. Um, but it was more about, the nightmares were about the the way that adults would perceive us or perceive me than the actual incident itself. And now, looking back at it after, you know, getting some treatment on it, barely any, I mean, it's uh, so many years ago, I know, it, I know it was impacting my behavior in my teens and in my early 20s, but um, I just see it as an unfortunate issue that happened but it was somewhat developmentally normal considering the circumstance of the other child involved. Um, and they had been tra traumatized as far as I know as well um, before this incident. But it was more that the adults <laughs> exasperated it because they didn't understand uh, what to do with it. Um, and so I've seen it in my own life as well. And I've had plenty of other traumas that I won't go into um, and, and not that I weigh them like a flag, but I've gotten treatment over it and now they don't bother me and, and a lot of things are resolved and I feel much, men much more mentally healthy. So, um, yeah, so even moving schools could be considered a, a mini trauma and this, 
it may not you know meet the criteria but if the event overwhelms the body and mind's ability to cope and then causes a whole litany of issues we can refer to it as a trauma or you know sometimes kids start acting out when they move schools well how do we know they haven't had a trauma and it's affecting their anxiety so let's talk a little bit about what you can do for trauma uh, or PTSD so I just want to quote some literature. These articles are actually on my website, paulkrauscounseling.com, which is one of my websites. According to the literature, this is from 1995, 56% of the general adult sample reported at least one traumatic event. That's from Kessler. 90% of mental health clients have been exposed to a traumatic event, and most have multiple experiences of trauma. That's Mooser et al., 1998. And 93% of adolescents in inpatient settings reported a history of trauma, and 32% had severe symptoms of PTSD. That's from Lipschick. Lip, I can't say it. Some German name. I'm German. Anyway, 1999 article. So we talked about the A study. We talked about that everyone's experienced some type of trauma, whether or not it, it impacted them with a lot of symptoms are different. But um, here's a little bit about EMDR. Um, I'm going to tell the story about EMDR, but let me just tell you how I understand it. It's not only effective for trauma and PTSD, but it can also be effective for other conditions, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. The reason I say that is because if a lot of those, if we can figure out why those other uh, maladies began, a lot of times they began in trauma. If we can treat the root cause, we can sometimes uh, help those uh, other symptoms like depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. Now we may need to employ many other types of therapy and become eclectic and blend. Um, EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, or as Francine Shapiro said, if she could rename it, she would just call it reprocessing therapy, which has a better name. I like that reprocessing therapy. It's evidence based for PTSD. It has successful outcomes. Um, and it's based on the adaptive information processing model, adaptive information processing, AIP. It posits that much of psychopathology is due to maladaptive coding and or incomplete processing of traumatic or disturbing life experiences. This impacts the person's ability to integrate these experiences in an adaptive manner. So one thing that I've thought about for a while is the way that um, some people in our culture deal with death is that we almost avoid it, we quick, we have the funeral, we get it over with, and there's not much grieving time. Um, maybe the person's actually cremated, and we never have a funeral. That's a popular trend these days. And Or maybe we have a memorial service, and that helps, but maybe that we're not fully through the grieving process. Um, you know, the five stages of grief, that's just, you know, and you can repeat that over and over, and there's no order to it, and... You can look that up, but one thing I, th I heard about once was um, the traditional um, Hebrew or Jewish people's way of dealing with death, and this is in the traditional communities, is that they would often um, have the dead body in the house and for seven days, and they would embalm the body and wash the body, and they would have the person who lost, you know, the widow or, or the children— you know, wear uh, ashes and sackcloth and force them to look at the body and cry and deal with it. And then they would have all these people from the community and the rabbi and, um, you know, relatives there to comfort them. But also, the, you know, they go through it. They go through grief. They'd cry. They'd scream at God. They'd scream at the universe. They'd be angry. They'd be in denial. They'd um, it'd eventually get to acceptance. And, the, and uh, I, I have to think that, you know, that sounds very terrible, but in a way, you through um, conscious, intentional suffering, you possibly could be able to process this trauma of the death better than just avoiding it. Um, so uh, anyway, just thought about that. But EMDR has had 48, over 48 clinical studies have demonstrated to be effective for people suffering from trauma. Um Let's see. EMDR is now respected throughout the healthcare community and is deemed evidence-based. Such diverse entities as the American Psychiatric Association, American Psychological Association, American Counseling Association, Department of Veterans Affairs, Department of Defense, the Substance Abuse Mental Health, um, whatever, Services, Health Administration, the World Health Organization, all recognize EMDR as very effective. Um, I believe the CDC, uh, or the World Health Organization, recommends it for trauma, as does the VA system. Now, EMDR has a eight-phase and three-pronged process. 
It facilitates the resumption of normal informational processing and integration. This treatment approach, which targets past experience, current triggers, and future potential challenges, results in the alleviation of presenting symptoms, a decrease or elimination of distress from the disturbing memory or trigger or whatever you want to call it, improved view of the self, relief from bodily disturbance, and a resolution of present and future anticipated triggers. Um, Let's see. So I got my training through the EMDR, Humanitarian Assistance Program, and the EMDR International Association, or EMDRIA. Let's see. I did two weekends. I'm on EMDR.com. I'm not currently paying EMDRIA to be listed, although I probably should. And I've done, uh, let's see, somewhere between 30 and 40 hours of additional training and consultation with advanced association, structural dissociation workshops with um, Kathleen Martin and my friend Sarah Jenkins. Sarah Jenkins is in Tempe, Arizona. She does um, equine-assisted EMDR, and she's become sort of famous for that. Um, A lot of, you know, that's advanced, advanced stuff when people really dissociate a lot, and you have to work on that. Um, because that can be a barrier to processing and integrating the trauma into the past and into time so that they can uh, have repaired processing and feel better and less depression and less symptoms. Um, So important notes I've written. um, I I found it very effective. It, It just depends on the person and how fast it works, but I've seen it work very rapidly, which is pretty incredible. I remember you know, I've, I've had it done on myself. This is another thing. I'll keep, I'll keep saying this. If you go to a therapist who tries to categorize you, put you in a box, and act like they're a know-it-all, and shove something down your throat that doesn't seem right, you probably are in the wrong office, okay? Uh, we have to have some humbleness, and I, I, I don't tell my patients about my therapy, but I will admit I go to therapy, because why shouldn't I go to therapy? I'm, you know... I could be vicariously exposed to trauma. I've heard, you know, for five years I worked with children that were abused. I heard all those stories. I mean, I'm not saying that's the trauma, but I'm saying I need to deal with what content is being thrown at me as well. So, of course, I have a therapist. Um, And I've done EMDR myself because I wanted to make sure it worked because I thought when I first heard about it, I didn't understand what in the world it was, and it sounded weird to me. So I had it done on me, and I was, like, very surprised. I was very surprised. Um... Important notes, EMDR is safe and non-invasive. It's obviously been, is reputable and evidence-based treatment recognized worldwide by various organizations and clinicians. It's successfully treated individuals with PTSD and a variety of other concerns. Um, You want to definitely have somebody who knows how to screen for that. It it incorporates, it can incorporate um, eye movement or non-invasive bilateral stimulation and also incorporate some talk therapy. Now, a lot of people use the light bar, the eye moving back and forth, but um, sometimes I use these EMDR buzzers, which are just little things you hold in your hand that buzzes back and forth. That's when you're actually getting into phase four, which is actually confronting the memory. There's so many other parts to the therapy, okay? That's just one part. That's the famous part, the reprocessing part. EMDR is not simply a series of procedures. EMDR is a way of moving through the counseling process with both an understanding of your unique situation, perspective, and feelings, and also a targeted therapy that will work to address the true roots of your current discomfort and symptoms. Okay, that is a key point. I have heard of clinicians in this area who will remain nameless because I've heard through secondary sources that they went to an EMDR clinician who did not try to establish rapport, who didn't teach them coping skills, who didn't bring them through the eight phases. They went to the fourth phase immediately and brought up the worst trauma of their life, did one session on it and said, okay, let's do the next trauma, next week, next trauma, next week, next trauma. Did not fully process the traumas, okay? Sometimes in reprocessing phase, phase four, you have to do the same trauma over and over and over again to get the subjective units of response which is the feeling in the body and and some of the mental cognitions, the negative cognitions, um, to reduce. And because there's so many things connected to that trauma, so many ways of thinking, so many negative symptoms. And that can actually almost be worse if you have somebody who's, oh, next week, let's talk about the next trauma. Next week, let's talk about the next trauma. You know, somebody with developmental trauma. You're just opening up all this pathway and not giving them any coping skills and being robotic about it. Your EMDR therapist should still have a relationship with you and talk to you about what to do outside a session, talk about coping skills, give you other homework. Uh, EMDR, again, is not a panacea. Nothing is. 
If you believe that, you, you know, buy the next multi-level marketing thing that comes out and then buy the next one because there is no panacea. There's no cure-all. It's, it's a process, but it will work over time. It can work. You may not find the right practitioner. Find another one. Um, EMDR is not a form of hypnosis or energy work, okay? It's not. Um, hypnosis can be great. It, it, it you know, clinical hypnosis, um, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it doesn't resolve your trauma. It's very relaxing. Um, EMDR is not based in new age belief uh, systems, okay? It has nothing to do with that. Um, I've heard people say that, you know, they're like, oh, what is this? Well, it's actually more scientific than lots of forms of therapy. Um, basically, no matter what your personal belief system, it should be serving your personal belief system. Um, you can be from any religion, any um, way of life, uh, does it any political system, whatever. It, we're working with your system, the positive and negative cognitions of your system. We're not imposing ours. Um, sometimes if somebody has very complex PTSD, um, you want to be going with an advanced EMDR practitioner, okay? So if you feel that you have complex PTSD, that's a very important point. Um, so that's just some about it. And I was reading an article the other day. This, the, a lot of these references are on my website, but I'll put them in the show notes. But um, it helps people cope and cope with difficult events, but also it helps people cope with these like feelings. Like you get this snap feeling. Like every time somebody says this one thing, it just drives you nuts. That can help. Uh, EMDR was actually invented by Francine Shapiro by accident. She's a California psychologist in 1987 while taking a walk through the woods. She saw that if she moved her eyes back and forth, it could reduce stress and anxiety. She started working with her patients on it. Eventually, it's been used to treat all, to all, all sorts of things. Um, EMDR uh, trainer Roger Solomon uh, is a police psychologist. He was interviewed in this, in this uh, paper I'm reading. This is real paper, actually, I'm reading off of. And uh, he discussed the adaptive information processing model in more detail. He says, this model posits that present, that present problems are the result of past distressing memories that have become frozen or stuck in the brain, including images, thoughts, beliefs, feelings, sensations, and they have been maladaptively stored. Um, and when there is a reminder, either external or internal, like a, a, something that reminds you of it, this maladaptively, maladaptively stored information gets triggered and is experienced in the present. So trauma is coming out of time back into current time. Um, so uh, based on this premise, EMDR seeks to help people effectively adapt to their lives once the trauma has occurred. Um, and EMDR gives those who suffer from trauma the possibility of reprocessing traumatic memories so that memories are able to become unstuck and processed in a way that is traumatized, that the traumatized person is able to understand. And uh, he sees it as the trans mutation of perpetual re-experiencing of distressing events with the learning experience that becomes a source of resilience. So you become stronger through this process, through confronting this darkness, this difficulty, um, you will actually become stronger. Uh, and you'll learn to adapt, and your mind will literally do the healing. Um, oh, here's an example. He says, uh, Dr. Solomon says, uh, using the experience of a war veteran, a war veteran experiencing a near-death experience in battle may have concluded, I am going to die, which becomes a maladaptively stored uh, belief in the brain, unable to process. When there is a present trigger, the distressing memory, including images, thoughts, and beliefs, and sensations associated with the event arise and are experienced as nightmares, flashbacks, and other symptoms of PTSD. Once the veteran is properly able to reprocess this inf information after undergoing EMDR, the veteran can think of the battle event and know at the at a felt body level and a mental level that he survived and the war is over. Now, it's not that simple, but that's just one example. Um, there's a lot of theories about why um, EMDR works um, better than talk therapy and other forms. Um, there's the working memory theory, um, that basically the eye movements or the bilateral stimulation uh, show a significant reduction in memory vividness and with the associated emotion. The working memory theory posits that the working memory has a very limited capacity. When it is tax taxed by completing tasks of holding a memory in mind while moving the eyes, there is a degradation of performance. The results in the distressing memory losing its quality and power. That's part of it. Um, REM, rapid eye movement, sleep theory, 
which uh, the hypothesis that eye movements stimulate the same neurological processes that take place during REM or the bilateral stimulation the back and forth, left, right, REM or dream sleep. If you don't know what that is, you can Google what is REM sleep and you'll find out, um, which is important in processing and consolidating information. It is possible that EMDR helps a person process traumatic memory in much of the same way that dreaming allows us to process the events in our daily lives. I'm not really sure if that's true, but anyway, these are just theories because we do know that, but it is bringing it up in a safe way. And there's something with the bilateral stimulation that is, is, is allowing us to access uh, different parts of our mind or it's, it's helping our mind heal itself. Memory reconsolidation theory um, is a process used by therapists to reorder or recode memories once a traumatic event has been unlocked or accessed. Accessing a memory and updating it with new contradictory information like a positive cognition or putting it in time or addressing the maladaptive thought enables the potential for the original memory to be transformed or reconsolidated in, a, in an altered form. So you're reconsolidating your memory. This differs from other trauma-focused therapies such as cognitive behavioral therapy where the underlying mechanism is hypothesized to be habituation and extinction, which are thought to create a new memory while leaving the original one intact. Um, in this instance, traumatic memory changes and transform. It doesn't disappear completely. There are two, and with EMDR, you're sort of integrating. Um, a lot of time, EMDR people experience in, with trauma. They have ambivalence. They feel this way about it. They feel this way about it. They feel two or three different ways about it. So EMDR, I feel like, does a better job at integrating um, your experience and being able to sort of transform, move on. Then there's the parasympathetic nervous system theory. This is. Um, the part of our nervous system that helps us calm down and relax. It slows the heart, dilates blood vessels, relaxes the muscles in the gastrointestinal tract, and increases digestive juices, and decreases pupil size. As far as the relation between the parasympathetic nervous system and EMDR, it's possible that eye movements eliciting an orienting response which activates the parasympath parasympathetic nervous system and lowers arousal. Simply put, rapid eye movement and EMDR seems to be relaxing. This theory has support from research showing eye movement lowers arousal for distressing memories says Dr. Solomon. Now, here's the deal. It's probably doing all four of these. It's, it's, we always want to find out what's the one answer. Well, there's probably more answers than these four. Um, now, with EMDR, there's a talk part of therapy, and but sometimes people don't really want to talk about the memory, so I just have them bring it up. I do need to know some details about it, but um, I don't need them to like rehash the whole thing and, and tell it. Like Sometimes I go to a therapist's office, well, what's the problem? Well, here, let me tell you about my whole childhood. That's not exactly what you have to do with EMDR. Um, but we do try to figure out what the cognitive negative cognitive distortion is. Um, okay, so... That's a little bit about EMDR. Some other treatments, obviously trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapy. Talk therapy, if you have a trauma-informed therapist, can help. Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, DBT, equine-assisted EMDR, brain spotting. I haven't done that one yet. I've heard it's great. Learning about the brain, so using neurobiology and treatment, insight-oriented therapy, ACT coping skills, um, things that help you connect the opposites. But I do believe EMDR has something special because it uses bilateral stimulation, a physical thing in the office, um, which is why all these therapies could help. But if you want the fastest results, I do think EMDR is the best. But using these other ones aren't wrong at all. But I do think the integration of mind-body is a very important point, which we've been talking about, where CBT is more talking about it. It, it may not be accessing the memory or the trauma in, in the way you're accessing it with your logical mind. Logic is very big in CBT. If you've ever done cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive distortions, what are those? Talk yourself out of it. Okay, it's a very good thing to learn, but it may not be getting deep enough, um, fast enough for me. Uh, I don't want to just keep having to memorize a script and do my little journal. I want, to, I want relief, so I think EMDR works faster on that. But I do think knowing cognitive behavioral therapy is good for any patient, any client, or uh, any therapist to at least start with. Um, because EMDR, a lot of a lot of the trauma is experienced in the body. Like when you see, you know, let's say that um, every time you see a red mailbox, it reminds you of, of this bad event. Well, you know, you feel that in the body. It's not like you're like, oh, a red mailbox. Interesting. That reminds me of so-and-so. It's not a logical process. It's a physical felt response. So EMDR and other therapies really do connect the mind-body. 
Um, so, let's see. Medications are a form of treatment. They do not cure post-traumatic stress disorder, but some medications could help a person better tolerate therapy and have more emotional space or bandwidth to function. Um, now, medications, you know, this is, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I, I don't believe, you know, I think you have to weigh the side effects versus what's needed. So if you are really suffering from PTSD, medications may be for you for the short term until you can get into therapy and resolve this. But it's sort of like a Band-Aid being put over a cut that requires stitches. It may keep it from getting infected, but there's going to be an enormous scar there, and it may take a very long time to heal unless one receives the stitches they need to integrate. Um, speaking of that, there's a psychiatrist uh, who wrote this article in the New England uh, from the New England Medical Center. Actually, I'm not sure where, what magazine this is from, but uh, I, I do think this speaks to some of the attitude in psychiatry that I'd like to see changed. Um, the idea that a person's past, this is by Dr. Keith Russell Ablo, a writer and senior resident at psychiatry at New England Medical Center in Boston. The idea that a person's past could unconsciously and dramatically influence the present used to make me smirk. When I was a medical student, delving deep into a patient's early experiences was the part of psychiatry that seemed the most eccentric and the least doctorly. I suspect, notice that word, doctorly. I suspected the whole notion of unconscious connections between past and present was a powerful myth spun by creative minds who had broken with scientific process and wandered to guesswork. I, on the other hand, would keep my feet firmly grounded in fact. By listening to my patients, but my listening to patients, my patients have proven me wrong. Again and again, decisions they made turn out to have undeniable connections with earlier experiences in their lives. It is as if forgotten or seemingly disconnected chapters in their lives continued to influence the evolving plots. One patient came to the clinic seeking treatment for extreme stress. His second marriage was to a chronically sick woman whose care took almost all of his time. I'm at the end of my rope, he said. I'm wearing myself out running, to, running her to doctor appointments, making sure she takes her medications, and taking the kids so that she can rest. I'm just beat. He had been married previously to a woman who had ultimately died from a disease that was already taking its toll when they met. During our fourth meeting, my patient's devotion to these ill women began to take the tone of servitude. He described the responsibility as inescapable, as if he was destined to be forever both husband and nurse. Did anyone get sick in your family when you were a child or die? I asked. No, no one. Why? He asked. Anyone? I pressed. A friend, maybe? Well, sure, now that you mention it, my best friend in fourth grade, he said. Then he fell silent for a few moments, his eyes welling with tears. We were like the same person, see? I, I remember going to visit him in the hospital. What was that like for you? I asked. The worst thing wasn't all the tubing they'd stuck in him, he said. It was this nurse who kept telling me, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. The plot made irresistible sense. Having been told as a boy that he could do nothing to save his precious friend, my patient seemed to be desperately engaging illness in a battle as a man. Part of the evidence that an unconscious link with the past is truly at the heart of a current behavior pattern is the patient's response and the connection is uncovered. There is often a moment of astonishment or embarrassment that the relationship could have gone unnoticed so long. The sudden flash of recognition, similar to the response of encountering an old friend while traveling in a distant land. What are you doing here? You know, the look of that. A woman who was ending a friendship of 20 years described the relationship as, quote, one-sided. She had suffered through decades of supporting her friend emotionally without the effort ever being reciprocated. Why have you decided to end a friendship now after so long? I asked. The final straw, she said, was when she told me that she'd have to cancel, I'd have to cancel my trip to see her because her son would be visiting unexpectedly. There's only one bare, spare bedroom. I said I'd be happy to sleep on the couch, but she wouldn't hear of it. It turned out that the woman had grown up in a family in which she and her siblings had been adopted. Although she begged to be placed with her sister, none of the adoptive families had room for two children. When she related the memory of her sadness to me, she suddenly grasped her forehead. She seemed surprised. When my friend didn't have room for me to visit, it was just like that, wasn't it? That's why it hurt so much. 
Seemingly independent experiences can even cause destructive patterns that include physical symptoms. Months ago, I treated a man who had endured, endured bouts of fear, heart palpitations, and sweating whenever his relationship with a woman seemed on the brink of marriage. His heart proved to be perfectly healthy, but three times his condition became severe enough that the woman he loved abandoned him. In talking about his childhood, he told me of his mother's cruelty. She'd say, come here, my sweetheart. Then when I did, she slapped me across the face. That vivid image from the past seemed like a part of the explanation for the patient's reoccurring symptoms. It made sense that being repeatedly seduced and then violently rejected by his mother could make him panic at the thought of confessing love. It could also lead him to test the affection of a mate by requiring a demonstration of unwavering commitment, like sticking by him through worsening illness. Insight-oriented psychotherapy presumes the existence of a core self with real hopes, needs, emotions that can be misdirected or thwarted by invisible anchors or past traumas, as though the mind is stuck in an oscillating circuit repeating destructive patterns endlessly. By connecting forgotten or seemingly unrelated experience with experiences with present emotions and decisions, psychiatrists hope that patients will be free to chart a truer course. The first man I described, for example, might allow himself more freedom from his current role as his wife's caretaker. He might better understand his motivation should there come a time when he considers commitment to another debilitated woman. The woman who decided to end her friendship might reevaluate how much of her anger can be traced to her earlier abandonment. She might wonder whether she seeks out relationships in which she is consistently the more giving partner. And rather than breaking off, she might be able to help her friend understand her true need for support and reassurance. Sometimes people feel that the easy way out is to forget the pain, to, quote, let sleeping dogs lie. But keeping the past buried is not a passive process. It takes mental energy to suppress the painful memories that lead to unhealthy patterns. Note that, mental energy to suppress the painful memories. One patient locked in repeated, exhausting struggles with authority figures has, had been recounting her physical abuse as a child. When we began touching in the most hurtful aspects, she, began, she became evasive. Eventually, she took to starting each therapy session with a long rendition of how her day had been spent. Sometimes she wandered into her opinion of world events. You seem to be spending a lot of your energy and our time avoiding the painful topic we've been talking about, I finally commented. I keep running into corners and you keep trying to flush me out, she said. Exactly. By exposing memories that wreak havoc undercover, the energy of running away, whether it's to one's daily routine or to unhealthy relationships or to alcohol, can better be directed. As a psychiatrist, I must remain cautious as I settle on these understandings of how earlier chapters in patients' lives are influencing their present emotions and behaviors. If the connections I identify makes no sense to people I am trying to help, they will be of little value to them. I may press my point by reviewing the evidence for the connection or introducing consistent new evidence as it unfolds. But other times, I come to feel, far from my patient being resistant, the scenario I have presented has no inherent power to move him or her. The only thing separating fiction from fact, or fiction from truth, is the patient's life story, in fact. That individual's sense of whether the plot feels right, not whether or not it's historically accurate, that's a key point. We don't know the facts about our patients. They know the facts about our patients. And that is the problem with the medical paradigm sometimes. All doctors believe they know the absolute truth. They may not know. They might know part of the truth. Knowing precisely when to abandon my version of a patient's life story is difficult because there is no way to objectively confirm or refute it. The original manuscript is unavailable. I can never know for sure whether a patient's protest against a connection I propose represents a well-defended fortress or is simple honesty. That's what we call, we, there's some transference, counter-transference going on here, and he's, he's fishing because this is an older article. <laughs> Furthermore, my own life story will influence... Uh, which themes I identify as compelling, those which I am happy to skim over, and those which never occur to me at all. I look for hints in my patient's behavior. Tears, surprise, or anger at a connection I propose make me want to delve deeper. So too does a knee-jerk or impassioned rejection. If the patient misses the next appointment, I wonder whether I've hit a raw or true nerve, or whether I have wandered hopelessly afar. Considered... Skepticism makes me feel most strongly that I am off base. The truth in psychotherapy is ultimately what feels true. The facts are subjective. That doesn't bother me anymore. The validity of the connections I uncover is determined by whether they alleviate my patient's pain and improve their lives. Dr. Kenneth Russell Ablo. Now, there's a very humble psychiatrist and a very smart one. Now, that was probably written years ago um, before EMDR was invented. EMDR is kind of like a guide and, and, a, and a methodology to do what he was talking about without having to do all the fishing. The patient and the client will do the fishing. 
for you. So I just wanted to read that because it was quite eloquent and it's from another decade. Um, other treatments for trauma, uh, natural approaches or alternatives. I like using you know, natural approaches with counseling or medications with counseling. Um, naturopathic medicine, there are licensed naturopathic doctors in 23 states. They're actually licensed as actual physicians. That's um, different than naturopathic practitioners. Anyway, they have the same name. Um, but there's only a few of them that do it well. Uh, so find out ones that are trained in mental health. Um, you know, physical activities can help with PTSD. Um, going to, you know, meditation retreats, things like this, mindfulness-based stress reduction. However, that's not going to work for somebody in the acute throes of post-traumatic stress or trauma. Um, so if you're going to go outside the realm of counseling, uh, which has been clinically proven to help PTSD, but some people want to go outside of it. I mean, if, and they want to go outside of medications. They don't even want to do naturopathic medicine. They want to go through a quick fix. They want to go ayahuasca or mushrooms or, or some shaman. Uh, you know, here's the problem. Uh, the brain does not work. Uh, the brain is not just going to instantly shift due to you taking a few mushrooms or taking ayahuasca. I'm sure it's doing something to your brain, but to heal from a traumatic event, we aren't going to have a light bulb turn on or off. It, 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 that is a cartoon way of seeing the brain. The brain takes time to process these things. And sure, bringing up a traumatic experience with some drug in your brain, I'm pretty sure they're doing experiments on that right now with ketamine, and that might help, but why put ketamine in your body when we have EMDR therapy and you can learn to tolerate the feelings in your body and learn this stuff? Is that, And EMDR can actually work fast depending on the person and their ability to move past their own um, blind spots or narrative. So... I've heard people anecdotally using ayahuasca and mushrooms um, trying to heal from trauma. And, you know, it's just not empirically proven. But it also, you know, as I said, trauma is not solved by epiphany. It can be helped by epiphany. It's part of the healing. Um, but if somebody's promising you a weekend with a shaman to do ayahuasca and mushrooms and they, they're telling you you're going to be over your trauma, that is a bunch of crap. That is marketing. That's snake oil. Um, please go to a licensed trauma-informed counselor, a licensed trauma-informed psychiatrist, or a licensed trauma-informed naturopathic doctor. And in my opinion, you probably should be, if you really want to get past your trauma, I would be engaging with multiple practitioners, um, both doctors and counselors. Um, there is no quick, easy fix for trauma or PTSD. If you think about it, uh, the way the brain works, a lot of trauma developed over time. It's not just the traumatic event. It's how the brain readjusted afterwards and became fixed in that pattern of thinking, um, which led to dr uh, more depression or more anxiety. And it's the, the amount of time since the trauma's passed also. Um, everybody's a little bit different and our bodies heal differently, but uh, there is there can be resilience built after trauma if you get the right treatment. Uh, but remember, it can influence epigenetically and physically uh, lots of not just mental um, brain issues with anxiety, depression, anger. We, remember we talked about earlier with the ACEs study, it can influence all sorts of physical problems, obesity, um, using drugs and alcohol, um, different diseases. So we have to, we, we've seen the hard outcomes here. Do not take this lightly. Um, if you've had any trauma or know someone who does, please get them help. There is help available. It's just, it's just not in the simple paradigm of, of sometimes of our culture of this quick fix, but it, it will help you. Um, working on, you know, things you can do at home, you know, self-care methods can help you. Reading books can help you, but please get with a practitioner if you're really suffering. And there's so much more to talk about this topic, but um, right now that's all I've kind of got to say right now. It's been a, a longer podcast and I appreciate you listening. And I'll see you back here with more interviews soon. Thanks for listening to The Intentional Clinician. This is Paul Krauss. Once again, it's been my pleasure to talk about trauma, PTSD, EMDR therapy, and other things you can do. As I said a few times, there is so much more I could say about this. And I'm not even a researcher or a scholar. I am a counselor. I've been practicing for 10 years now as a licensed professional counselor. And also, I do consulting now. 
and I am also a clinical supervisor. So if you're looking for a consultant, behavioral health consultant, to consult with your school, your business, or you're a family looking for answers, um, I can be reached. My webpage is paulkrauscounseling.com, and I also uh, run a clinic in Grand Rapids called Health for Life Grand Rapids, and you can find us on the web at healthforlifegr.com. We have some fantastic counselors working with us uh, that all have their own specialties, and so you can check that out, including two naturopathic physicians from Arizona who provide education in Michigan. I also spend some time in Arizona every year, sometimes for a week or sometimes for a weekend, to do a lot of continuing education and um, do some work there, um, training and consulting and other things. So you might find me there as well. I'm doing a lot more interviews this year. I've got some excellent ones lined up. I'm very excited to share them with all of you. If you've got any time and you'd love to rate this podcast, I'd really appreciate it on iTunes or share it with your friends. And if you'd like to be a guest on this podcast, you can give me an email. You can find my email on paulkrauscounseling.com. And remember to stay safe out there, everybody, and take care. If you need a counselor, make sure you find one immediately. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss, and while these are based upon the literature he has read and his experience in the field, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on the subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line. Call 1-800-273-8255. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local professional counselor in your area. A life coach is not a counselor. Please remember that. There's a vast difference in the training, and life coaches are not regulated and do not have a code of ethics book that I'm aware of although I've heard they're working on that. But for now, they don't. You can now make an appointment with Paul or one of his associates by emailing or calling Paul, although right now, to be quite honest with you, I have been quite um, busy in terms of availability to help people at this point, but um, I can always try to refer you to somebody I know if uh, I can't help you. The information for this is on healthforlifegr.com, where Paul sometimes writes blogs, paulkrauscounseling.com, and also some information about counseling supervision in Michigan at counselingsupervisorgr.com. In terms of consulting, you just have to reach out to me directly or trainings. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you keep listening the next time on The Intentional Clinician.